my name is Steve Lagoon, and I'm the president of Religion Analysis Service in Minnesota. And uh, we publish the Discerner magazine since 1946. It deals with uh, exposés on the various cults and isms. It is also includes some Christian apologetics. And uh, I became president like four or five years ago. Um, and I'm also a pastor, but I'm between churches right now, but uh, in the Baptist tradition. Last church I was pastor of was the North American Baptist Church. And uh, so that's kind of my background. I'm married for 32 years as of yesterday. Uh, and I left my, left my bride at home. It's her birthday today. So her anniversary yesterday, her birthday today. But we'll have a good time when I get back. Anyway, um, this presentation, Charles asked me to give an overview of some of the flip-flops and doctrinal changes and prophetic blunders of the Watchtower. And if you are in ministry to Jehovah's Witness, this will be, this will be kind of a, a review for you. Uh, but if you're not familiar with the material, it's rather amazing when you think about it that uh, intelligent people continue to believe that the Watchtower is God's sole channel of communication in the world. I'm not a graphic designer, so you'll notice that the PowerPoint is a very basic uh, presentation. I do not have photocopies of the Watchtower. I just have quotations, so I apologize if it's not uh, uh, viewer friendly, but hopefully the information will come across. So there's a lot of material that I'd like to cover, uh, particularly at the end of the presentation, I want to talk about this doctrine of new light. Uh, when I talk to Jehovah's Witnesses, the new light doctrine seems to be uh, a big issue. So I will be talking about that uh, quite a bit toward the end of the presentation. So we'll first look at the unique claims to represent Jehovah on the earth. We'll consider their record, how good has their record been and then examine the doctrine of new light. So you can go ahead with the next one. The Watchtower Bible and Tract Society claims to be God's unique channel of communication to the world today. It alone speaks for God. Only its members are in right communion with God. Salvation is only possible through the organization. The organization is led by the faithful and discreet slave who alone can properly interpret the Bible. Next. This is an amazing quotation. Uh, Unless we are in touch with God's channel of communication that God is using, we will not progress along the road to life no matter how much Bible reading we do. Watchtower 12 1981. And the way I've listed these is when I was preparing the presentation, I could have drawn uh, from many sources, but what I did is the one I happened to draw it from uh, in this particular case, uh, David Reed's book, Index of Watchtower Errors. Um, and the question I have down at the bottom, so could anyone understand the Bible before the Watchtower began in 1879? That would be seen to be a problem if you need to have this channel of communication. So, uh, and let me just say again, by way of introduction, that there is lots of excellent materials out there uh, that give this information. A lot of it's available on the, on the web, uh, internet. So I could have chosen any one of the sources, but I just put up a source here, uh, David Reed in this case. So next slide. Salvation then is dependent on the watchtower. That faithful slave is the channel through which Jesus is feeding his true followers in this time of the end. It is vital that we recognize the faithful slave. Our spiritual health and our relationship with God depend on this channel. And that is from the Watchtower, July 15, 2013. And uh, I drew that from the jwfacts.com website with, uh, I think his name is Paul Grundy. Uh, I'm amazed by that website. It's just powerful, great information. 
Okay, next slide. So salvation, again, depending on the watchtower. The watchtower, July 15, 2011. We need to obey the faithful and discreet slave to have Jehovah's approval. And the next one, since Jehovah God and Jesus Christ completely trust the faithful and discreet slave, should we not do the same? So these are amazing claims, very audacious, uh, almost arrogant uh, claims that the Watchtower is making that uh, anyone in the world who wants salvation must come through their organization. Next slide, please. Yeah. Sure. The faithful and discreet slave is the leadership of the Watchtower organization. It used to be uh, that there was, uh, the teaching was that there was 144,000 Jehovah's Witnesses who alone had a heavenly hope, and the rest were the great crowd who only had an earthly hope. And then out of that 144,000, there was a select group that was chosen or uh, became the governing body, the leader. Uh, this has changed now so that the faithful and discreet slave is now identified specifically as just the governing body of the leaders of the Watchtower organization. I'm sorry? Yeah. Yeah. yeah and it's amazing. And we'll look at some of them, and in my presentation is selective. So we'll see some of those, but we won't see all 15 of them. The Watchtower Prophet. So the April 1st, 1972... Uh, Watchtower talks about the prophet. So does Jehovah have a prophet to help them, to warn them of dangers and declare things to come? Identifying the prophet, these questions can be answered in the affirmative. Who is this prophet? This prophet was not one man, but was a body of men and women. It was a small group of footstep followers of Jesus Christ, known at that time as international Bible students. Today, they are known as Jehovah's Christian Witnesses. Next slide, please. Of course, and this is continuing from the same article, it is easy to say that this group acts as a prophet of God. It is another thing to prove it. The only way that this can be done is to review the record. What does it show? And Laurie McGregor makes this comment. Since the witnesses claim, uh, if you don't know Laurie McGregor, she is a former Jehovah's Witness who has a, a long ministry uh, from Canada wonderful uh, 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 ministry. She said, since the witnesses claim to be God's prophet, we are free to put them to the Bible test for a prophet found in Deuteronomy 18, 18 through 20. The Watchtower has invited us to examine their record, and we will. Next slide. And so examining the prophet's record. At this point, we will examine the record of the Watchtower in preparation of an evaluation of its claim status of God's prophet and sole channel of salvation. Next slide. So those 144,000 that we were talking about, are drawn from Revelation 7 and 14, logically the calling of the little flock would draw to a close when the number was nearing completion. And the evidence is that this, the general gathering of these specially blessed ones ended in 1935. And that was the view for a long time as I've been Talking with Jehovah's Witnesses over the last 20, 25 years, that was always the view. Uh, however, that has changed. The next slide, please. Hence, especially after 1966, it was believed that the heavenly calling ceased in 1935. Thereafter, any called to the heavenly hope were believed to be replacements for anointed Christians who had proved unfaithful. So that was the only way that you could become an anointed one is if somebody like Ray Franz had apostatized, and you could take their place. Otherwise, heaven was pretty much closed in 1935. Okay, next slide. Now, uh, this was changed as of Watchtower uh, 5-1-2007. We cannot set a specific date for when the calling of Christians to the heavenly hope ends. And Paul Grundy points out, since this statement, the number of reported partakers has climbed from about 8,000 to 18,000, which was amazing to me because for years and years, uh, the number that was left was always said to be around 8,000. 
And you kept thinking, when is that going to drop further and further? The idea was that the date was tied to 1914, that all of those anointed, at least some of them, were going to be alive until Armageddon, some of those who were alive in 1914. However, that uh, pressure forced them to drop that idea. And now there's 18,000, 10,000 more who are claiming to be of the anointed. I'm just wondering, and I just threw this in, no extra charge. I'm just wondering if the Watchtower might be thinking eventually of changing their viewpoint on the distinction between the great crowd and the 144,000. So I'm just totally speculating here. Uh, but I give a couple of reasons for that. The, uh, the domestic, since they've changed the uh, faithful and discreet slave to just the governing body, now the domestics are in, included in that are the other anointed brothers along with the great crowd. They're kind of together. So I could see where they might be looking at making a, uh, a getting rid of the distinction. And then this Nethanim uh, group that aids the governing body, uh, I'm just speculating uh, that might be a halfway step onto a new view where there won't be a uh, distinction. So we'll see how that plays out. It's just a, a theory that I have. But the idea we just want to show is the changes that are occurring with the Watchtower. Okay, next slide. This generation, the 1914 generation. So for a long time, if you studied with Jehovah's Witnesses or are uh, witnessing to Jehovah's Witnesses, you knew that these uh, anointed ones who were alive in 1914 were going to survive till Armageddon. And that was actually a sign that it was coming soon. It must be coming soon because they're all getting older and older and older. And so uh, there are, but there, this is from the truth that leads to eternal life, the blue book from 1968. But there are people still living who were alive in 1914 and saw what was happening then and who were old enough that they still remember those events. This generation is getting up in years now. A great number of them have already passed away in death. Yet, Jesus pointedly said, this generation will by no means pass away until all these things occur. Some of them will still be alive to see the end of the wick this wicked system. This means only a short time is left before the end comes. And of course, 1968 was right in the lead up to the uh, false prophecy about 1975. But at this time, they were still convinced that uh, it was coming soon, and so 1914 was still linked uh, with this, the generation that would see Armageddon arrive. Okay, the next slide. The view that linked Armageddon to the 1914 generation was held from 1951 to 1995, although there were refinements as to what generation meant. Uh, so there was, what did it mean? Did you have to be uh, old enough to understand the events of 1914, or could you have just been born by 1914? So they're kind of moving that target, trying to buy more time. But in 1995, there was a major change. Uh, nevertheless, the strain of extending the 1914 generation finally had to break the interpretation, and you can go to the next slide, thank you. So now, in 1914, uh, was delinked from this generation. In our preceding article, we noted how the wicked Jewish generation that called for the blood of Jesus met its end. What then of the ruinous generation of mankind that even now opposes or ignores him? When will judgment on this faithless generation be executed? And continue the next slide. Eager to see the end of this evil system, Jehovah's people have at times speculated about the time when the Great Tribulation would break out. By the way, they always kind of make it look like Jehovah's people, but it was actually the Watchtower leadership and the official Watchtower material that was doing speculating would break out, even try tying this to calculations of what is the lifetime of a generation since 1914. However, we bring a heart of wisdom in, not by speculating about how many years or days make up a generation like they had been doing for 40 years. Rather than provide a rule for measuring time, the term generation as used by 
Jesus refers principally to contemporary people of a certain historical period with their identifying characteristics. So they're basically saying that uh, anyone born after 1914 and witnessing the events of that post-1914 world would count as the generation. So that now delinks it from 1914 and buys them a lot of time. Uh, okay, next slide, please. This generation unlinked from 1914, then continuing. So the recent information in the Watchtower about this generation did not change our understanding about what occurred in 1914. But it did give us a clearer grasp of Jesus' use of the term generation, helping us to see that his usage was no basis for calculating, counting from 1914, how close to the end we are. Next slide, please. It cannot be missed that the Watchtower was here criticizing what itself had been advocating for a generation. The new view, ironically for a generation, the new view was that the generation was anyone living in the post-1914 world and not necessarily to those living in 1914. Specifically, it referred to those wicked peoples of the world that ignored the message of Jehovah's Witnesses. This interpretation seemed to remove the sense of prophetic urgency. Next slide. The next view then, and this again isn't all the views, there were more, but this is the next one. Uh, as a class, these anointed ones make up the modern day generation of contemporaries that will not pass away until all these things occur. This suggests that some who are Christ's anointed brothers will still be alive on earth when the foretold great tribulation begins. So now it's not the the, this generation doesn't refer to all those wicked people who don't listen to Jehovah's organization. Now it's the anointed ones of the Jehovah's Witnesses are the, this generation. Kind of a, a dramatic change there. Next slide, please. This further change of view re-identifies the people of this generation who will not pass away before Armageddon from the wicked people of the post-1914 generation to the anointed Jehovah's Witnesses. This is about as 180 degree change of view you could make. The claim continues to remove the sense of prophetic urgency since new anointed brothers continue to replace others that had apostatized. Next slide. And the next view, this generation anointed and overlapping. John Barr, choice read, and this is from uh, Watchtower, June 15th, 2010. John Barr, Choice read the comment. I believe he is on the governing body. Choice read the comment. Jesus evidently meant that the lives of the anointed ones who were on hand when the sign began to be evident in 1914 would overlap with the lives of other anointed ones who would see the start of the Great Tribulation. We do not know the exact length of this generation, but it includes those two groups whose lives overlap. Even though the anointed vary in age, those in the two groups constituting this the generation are contemporaries during the part of the last days. How comforting it is to know that the younger anointed contemporaries of those older anointed ones who discerned the sign when it became evident beginning in 1914 will not die before the great tribula tribulation starts. So Paul Grundy kind of explained it that the, the previous two views weren't, didn't have the same sense of urgency uh, as the old view that was tied in 1914. So this is sort of return, linking it back to 1914, but just saying that these two generations overlap. So basically, you can say there will be a time limit to this one. There's, it, it restores a sense of urgency because now there, how long can two generations last? We know one generation has passed away, but this second generation that overlapped with the one from 1914, they will not pass away before Armageddon occurs. So it buys them time, yet still restores some sense of urgency. So a lot of games being played, flip-flopping all over the place. Let's go to the next slide. The latest view amazingly takes away with one stroke the key changes made. Well, I pretty much just said that. Let's move on to the next slide. I just made those comments. Uh, so, some quick hitters here. 
Watchtower view of Christ's presence. Originally, the Watchtower taught that Jesus' invisible presence began in 1874. The millennium began in 1874 with the return of Christ. That's from the finished mystery, 1917. And then, surely, there is not the slightest room for doubt in the mind of a truly consecrated child of God that the Lord Jesus is present and has been since 1874. There was no room for doubt whatsoever. Of course, they did change that. Let's go to the next slide. So Jesus' presence began now, not in 1874, but in 1914. Since 1914, how remarkably events in this blood-stained earth have confirmed that year to be the start of the day of Jesus' presence. So in 1914, not 1874. That's from Revelation. It's grand climax at hand. Next slide. Ray Franz, the former governing body member, made this comment in Crisis of Conscience. Today, the several million of Jehovah's Witnesses believe and teach that Christ's invisible presence began in 1914. Very few realize that for nearly 50 years, the Watchtower Society announced and heralded in their role as prophet that such an invisible presence began in 1874. As late as 1929, 15 years after 1914, they were still teaching this. One of my uh, joys, uh, this summer I'm working at Minnesota, uh, the airport in Minnesota, and uh, just for the summer. And one of the fun things about that is when I leave uh, work, there's often a table with Jehovah's Witnesses sitting there. So I stop in and say hi regularly and, and have chats with them. And I was just talking to a gal yesterday and, and shared this information about uh, 1874, and she had never heard it. And I told her it was believed for almost 50 years, and she just couldn't believe that. And she's been in the witnesses since the uh, early 70s. So I think she'll have something to check out. Uh, next slide, please. Ray Franz on Christ's kingdom rule. Jehovah's Witnesses today believe that Christ officially began his kingdom rule in 1914. The Watchtower taught for decades that this took place in 1878. Next slide. And here's the uh, uh, illustration of that. The former inauguration of his king, kingly office dates from 1878. That's from Studies in the Scriptures, Volume 4. Next slide. Kingly rule, not from 1878, but 1914. This means that Jesus Christ began to rule as king of God's heavenly government in 1914 from the Live Forever book. Next slide, please. Armageddon. When is Armageddon going to come? Many people are familiar with this. The battle of the great day of God Almighty, which will end in AD 1914 with the complete overthrow of Earth's present rulership, is already commenced. Studies in the Scriptures, Volume 2. Got that from E.B. Price, one of the more interesting books I have in my library. E.B. Price is a Seventh-day Adventist who wrote a pretty good critique of the Jehovah's Witnesses. Anyway, um, the Jehovah's Witnesses believed absolutely that 1914 was not going to be the start of things, but was going to be the end of things. And uh, you can just get 40 or 50 comments to show that with ease. Next slide. Armageddon was in, would be in 1915. Lori McGregor shows that the original time is at hand. Uh, the 1911 edition showed that Armageddon would be in 1914. But then the 1915 edition changed it from 1914 to 1915. Uh, next slide. Armageddon will be in 1918. According to the Finnish mystery, it is the day of vengeance which began in the world in the World War of 1914, and which will break like a furious morning storm in 1918. So we've got 1914, 1915, 1918. Next up. Next slide, please. All right. Uh, also in the year 1918, when God begins to destroy the churches and church members by the millions as part of Armageddon, where God would judge everyone. Studies in Scriptures, Volume 7. Next slide, then. 1925. So now we have a new leader of the, of the Watchtower, not uh, C.T. Russell anymore, but now it's Judge Rutherford. 
And he developed the idea that millions now living will never die, uh, a sermon and then a book by that title. Uh, he said the year 1925 is a date definitely and clearly marked in the scriptures, even more clearly than of 1914. Therefore, we may confidently expect that 1925 will mark the return of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and the faithful prophets of old. So Armageddon was going to occur, and God was going to restore the old Jews, uh, the old uh, ancient worthies of old to life. And you're probably, at least some of you are familiar with the story that Jehovah's Witnesses were encouraged to prepare for the resurrection of all these Old Testament saints. They were encouraged to add on rooms to their houses because they're going to need some place to live. And they also built a home in San Diego called Beth Sarim. Uh, Ed Gruss has done incredible work in that area. Uh, some excellent material about that. But the house was actually deeded to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I just recently listened to uh, uh, our good friends from a Watchman Fellowship uh, and uh, he, uh, the presentation, they, they mentioned that, uh, that if David or Abraham came, they would have to go, the, the procedure would be that they'd have to go to the Watchtower headquarters and prove that they were who they were, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Very interesting, but they absolutely were convinced that by 1925 that Armageddon would occur and all the, the resurrection of the worthies would occur. Of course, it did not happen. Next slide. 1941, uh, in the remaining months before Armageddon, the 915-1944 Watchtower says. Next slide. In 1975... Uh, about 1975 from the Kingdom Ministry of 3-1968, there are only about 90 months left before 6,000 years of man's existence on earth is completed. The majority of people living today will probably be alive when Armageddon breaks out. There's several other quotes we can talk about showing 1975, but that should suffice to show their viewpoint. Next up. Who is the faithful and discreet slave? As our brother was talking about over here, who is it? Well, initially it was believed to be a body. It was the body of Christ. The Watchtower, October, November 1881. Charles Russell believed that it was the body of Christ, the faithful and wise servant. Next slide. And can I uh, ask somebody what time it is? Anybody got? 11.30? I might just make it. I know you want to eat lunch too. All right, the next one, uh, it was Russell in his person, not, not a group, not a class, not the body of Christ, but it was Russell in his person. And uh, this one, Watchtower 12 1, 1916. Russell died October 31st, Halloween night, 1916. So this uh, follows shortly after his death. Thousands of the readers of Pastor Russell's writings believe that he filled the office of that faithful and wise servant, and that his great work was giving to the household of faith meat in due season. His modesty and humility precluded him from openly claiming this title, but he admitted as much in private conversation. Dwayne Magnani has published a lot of great material about the faithful and discreet slave and the changes and so forth, uh, but this one shows the level of almost worship uh, an adoration they had toward uh, toward Russell and taught that he was in his person, the faithful and discreet slave. Next slide. Russell's death created a problem for Rutherford and the new leadership that followed him. If Russell was, in fact, the faithful and discreet slave and he had died, how would the Bible students receive their meat in due season? The answer that came forward was that Russell continued to lead the Watchtower organization from beyond the grave. Next slide. This finished mystery said this verse shows that though Pastor Russell had, has passed beyond the veil, he is still managing every feature of the harvest work. The Watchtower Bible and Tract Society is the greatest corporation in the world, which he is leading. Next slide. I just threw this one in because it's an oldie that I just love. This was 12-1-1916. Uh, Charles Taze Russell 
Thou hast by the Lord been crowned a king, and through the everlasting ages thy name shall be known amongst the people, and thy enemy shall come and worship at thy feet. Amazing the level of adoration for, toward Russell. Next slide. Faithful and discreet slave uh, Russell himself, we believe that all who are now rejoicing in present truth will concede that Brother Russell faithfully filled the office of the special servant of the Lord and that he was made ruler all over all the Lord's good. Sorry about the typo there. Uh, so um, it's very clear, but shortly to change. Next uh, slide, please. Now it becomes the more traditional view you might have been familiar with. Today the faithful and discreet slave is made up of the remnant of the kingdom heirs. These are anointed Christians, the remaining ones on earth of the 144,000 who belong to Christ. Next slide, please. Now, uh, as of July 15, 2013, it is no longer the class, it is no longer the 144,000 the governing body just decided, uh, let's just say it's us, and who's going to argue with them because they're the governing body. So uh, in recent decades, that slave has been closely identified with the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses. Note, however, that the word slave in Jesus' illustration is singular, indicating that this is a composite slave. The decisions of the governing body are thus made collectively. So that's the latest view. All right, next slide. When are the 6,000 years of human history going to end? Fascinating. Laurie McGregor kind of uh, gives uh, all those dates. 6,000 years from Adam ended in 1872, according to the Daily Heavenly Manna. And it ended in 1873, according to the Time is at Hand, page 33. 6,000 years of human history ended in 1972, according to The Truth Shall Make You Free. And it ended in 1975, according to the October 8th, 1968 Awake magazine. So, I don't know how they're coming up with these uh, calculations, but it moved from 1872 to, say, 1873 to 1972 to 1975. Uh, next slide. Adam's creation. Edmund, Edmund Gruss uh, provided this information in his book, the Jehovah's Witnesses and Prophetic Speculation. And he's going to tell us when Adam was created. Uh, the Watchtower uh, 1896 says Adam was created in 4,0129 BC. The time is at hand, however, has 4128. Uh, the truth shall make you free in 1943 said it was in 4,028 BC. The kingdom is at hand, says 4,026 B.C. Uh, the new heavens and the new earth in 1953 has it as 4,025 B.C. And then uh, all scripture is inspired in 1963. goes back to the 4,026. I don't know how they arrive at these things. But they, it just seems like, well, whatever is convenient. This is what we need it to be, so that's what we're going to say it is. And who's going to argue with them? They're the governing body, the wisest of all people throughout the earth. Anyway, next slide. Organ transplantation, uh, the gal that I talked to the other day at the airport told me she was a nurse. So I shared this one with her. In uh, 8 1961 someone wrote in with the question of the readers about organ transplantations, which were just becoming... Uh, uh, on the scene, and it said, however, it does not seem that any scriptural principle or law is involved. It therefore is something that each individual must decide for himself. If he is satisfied in his own mind and conscience that this is a proper thing to do, then he can make such provision and no one else should criticize him for doing it. That's, of course, uh, organ transplantation. Next slide. In 1967, the Watchtower reversed, completely reversed, not tacking, but complete reversal. Is there any scriptural objection to do donating one's body for use in medical research or accepting organs for a transplant from such a source? Did this include eating human flesh? 
sustaining one's life by means of the body or part of the body of another human, alive or dead? No, that would be cannibalism, a practice abhorrent to all civilized people. Go on to the next slide. Uh, continuing the same theme, when men of science conclude that this normal process will no longer work and they suggest removing the organ and replacing it directly with an organ from another human, this is simply a shortcut. Those who su submit to such operations are thus living off the flesh of another human. That is cannibalistic. However, in allowing man to eat animal flesh, Jehovah God did not grant permission for humans to try to perpetuate their lives by cannibalistically taking into their bodies human flesh, whether chewed or in the form of whole organs or body parts taken from others. I pointed that out to the gal at the airport, and she came in a few years after this. She says she had never heard this and doesn't believe it's true. So she'll have a chance to go and check out the facts. Joe's witness also used to say things about if you got a blood transfusion that you would take on the characteristics of the person who donated the blood. So I'll say the guy who donated the blood that you received was a criminal. Once you got his blood, then you'd start being a criminal. That kind of thing. Uh, next uh, slide. Again, a complete reversal. Not tacking, but a complete reversal to the original position that organ transplantation was a conscious matter. No longer prohibited. Some might be against it, some might be for it, but no Jehovah's Witness should have any disciplinary action taken for accepting an organ transplant. So I guess it's not uh, uh, definitely cannibalistic anymore. The next slide. View of the superior authority. Is this a, a well-known change that the Watchtower makes? Uh, first one, the church must not resist the powers that be except in matters of conscience. So that uh, the first one then, because uh, you would at times have to resist the superior authorities that they are asking you to do something against God. So Russell clearly believed in the traditional view that the superior, or, superior authorities were human governments. Next slide. However, in 1929, the Lord made clearly to appear to his people who constitute the higher powers, and since then they have been enabled to see clearly that the faithful ones must obey Jehovah God and Christ Jesus, who are the higher powers. This is bizarre. The shift to this view, uh, uh, that it is not, uh, the, go it, it is not uh, the government of the world, but it's Jehovah God and Jesus Christ. Next slide, please. It is, it is strange to suggest that Paul had Jehovah God and Jesus Christ in mind in Romans 13, 1 through 7, since these superior or governing authorities are themselves instituted by God. As I say, are called God's servants. How could God be God's servant? Doesn't make any sense. That view is illogical. Next view. Now, uh, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, Romans 13, 1. The devil has caused religionists to lay hold upon this scripture text and to induce men to believe that the higher powers are those men who hold the official positions in the government of the world. So the devil made people believe that the superior authorities are government officials. But, the next view, next slide please, they revert right back to that position that they claim was of the devil Yet over all these years, the Watchtower endeavored to provide timely spiritual food. In retrospect, the notable example of such food at the right time seems to have been the 1962 Watchtower articles clarifying the Christian position of relative subjection to government, governmental superior authorities. Next slide, Ray Franz uh, has a great um, uh, explanation of this, these changes. The initial understanding in Pastor Russell's time was that this expression, the higher powers of Romans 13, 1 through 7, referred to the governmental authorities of earth. In Judge Rutherford's time, this was denied, and the Watchtower stated categorically in 1929 that the higher powers were instead God and Christ. It said that the higher powers had no application whatsoever to secular authorities. This was acclaimed as evidence of the advancing light or truth shining forth to God's chosen people. 
30 years later, in 1962, that advanced light was rejected, and the view was reinstituted that the term did, in fact, apply to the secular authorities. Next slide. Ray France continues, as can be seen, the claim is made by the Watchtower that there was an actual progress made that in 1962, Jehovah's Witnesses, ostensibly for the first time, came to understand the principle of relative submission, and that while rendering submission to the secular authorities, they could not render total subjection to them. If those superior authorities asked them to do things in violation of God's law, they could not obey. The fact is that the understanding just stated was not in the least new. In Russell's time, it was always understood that subjection to secular authorities was only a relative subjection. The claim then that in Russell's time there was a deficiency of understanding as to the relative nature of subjection to secular authorities is patently false. That's Ray Franz from his In Search of Christian Freedom book. Next slide. So we see, we see again, back and forth, back and forth. Um, this one is just so amusing, the resurrection of the Sodomites. Um, I, don't, I didn't include all the slides, some of them in the same year, 1988. They took two different views and two different books they published. But just uh, to show back forth, back and forth here. And why did, they, why did they even let themselves get into this? Why does it matter if the resurrection, uh, if the Sodomites are going to be resurrected? But they just made it a problem for themselves. So uh, Judge Rutherford in his vengeance book said, God has given promise that in his due time, the Sodomites and the Jews shall be awakened out of death and given a fair trial under the righteous reign of Christ. So yes, the Sodomites will be resurrected. Next slide. No, they won't. He was pinpointing the utter impossibility of ransom for unbelievers or those willfully wicked because Sodom and Gomorrah were irrevocably condemned and destroyed beyond any possible recovery. So there you go, now it's no. And I, I think it, it's funny because during most of this period, the leader uh, of the theology of the, of the Watchtower was uh, Ray France's uncle, uh, Fred France. So I just wonder if he was in his own mind going back and forth, back and forth, and the rest were like, oh, whatever. Next uh, slide. Yes, the Sodomites will be resurrected. As in the case of Tyre and Sidon, Jesus showed that Sodom, bad as it was, had not got to the state of being unable to repent. So the spiritual recovery of the dead people of Sodom is not hopeless. Next slide, back to Noah. The people of Sodom and of the surrounding cities suffered a destruction from which they will apparently never be resurrected. The Live Forever book, 1989. There are more, but that should suffice. Back forth, back forth. Next slide, please. The devil's calendar, uh, most of the time the Watchtower used traditional Gregorian calendar, but then uh, uh, they became to object, uh, I think it was uh, Woodworth, objected to the pagan association with the traditional calendar like Thursday for Thor's Day or January for the god, goddess Janus. So next slide. Um, so... It was published in the Golden Age, uh, 410, 1935. The Watchtower stated, according to the word of God, the Gregorian calendar is entirely wrong. The making of the calendar uh, were done under the influence of Satan. So the Gregorian ca calendar is of Satan. Uh, next slide. But that was quickly dropped. Nevertheless, these attacks on the devil's calendar were quietly dropped, resuming to the use of the satanically inspired calendars after all. Back and forth, back and forth. Uh, next slide. The record and tacking. The defense that the Watchtower uses is to compare their changes to tacking as a sailboat goes back and forth as it is making progress forward. Let's go to, that's from 12-1-1981. Next slide. So the frequent changes are defended with this appeal to tacking, but we have seen that frequently the Watchtower reverts back completely uh, to positions that is rejected. It's not tacking, it's going completely back and forth. Next slide. And this is the, uh, the part uh, that I really want to focus on, if we can go to the next slide. New light. We've seen the watchtowers claim to represent God in a prophetic role. We have also seen their record as a prophet as a dismal failure. 
Yet Jehovah's Witnesses attempt to explain away all the failures by their appeal to new light. How do we respond? Next slide. Problems, next slide, problems with new light. In order to understand the Jehovah's Witnesses' mindset, it is essential to understand the belief in new light. This is the idea that God is progressively revealing new truth to the organization and its followers, and all the more so as we approach Armageddon. Next slide. This increasingly brightening new light not only shows new truth, but makes clear what former teachings should be discarded. The teaching is based upon certain verses, including Proverbs 4.18, which says, But the path of the righteous ones is like the bright light that is getting lighter and lighter until the day is firmly established. Next slide. And so this slide here shows uh, from 1981 a watchtower explanation of how this new light works. As for the wicked, they will walk in darkness. Yes, the path of the righteous is like the first gleam of dawn, shining ever brighter till the full lighted day. But the way of the wicked is like deep darkness. They do not know what makes them stumble. I sort of get a kick that they quoted the New International Version there. Note that the shining of light on the path of the righteous is progressive. It keeps shining ever brighter. We might illustrate this by a man who gets up before daybreak and who sets out on foot to travel through the countryside. He might see an outline of a building in the distance, but at first he cannot tell if it is a house or a barn. Next slide. Gradually as the day dawns and he gets closer, he can see that it is a house. After a while, he is able to tell that it is a wooden, not brick. Then later he can make out the color and so forth. Viewing certain matters from a distance in time and with only a little light on the subject, often we have an incomplete and even an inaccurate view of things. In such situations, we may well, we may well have been influenced by previous hell views. Next slide. But as the light gets brighter and we draw much closer to the events, then our understanding of the outworking of God's purposes becomes clearer. Prophecies open up to us as Jehovah's Holy Spirit sheds lights upon them and as they are fulfilled in world events or in the experience of God's people. Has this not been just the way that Jehovah has dealt with his servants in early times? Indeed, it has been. Watch Tower 12, 1, 1981. Now I want to get to my response to this. The, this doctrine makes much criticism of the Watchtower's past practices virtually futile. No matter how damning the past teachings of the Watchtower have been, the witness simply dismisses it as old light that has now been corrected. Indeed, with an almost perverse logic, the past false teachings merely reinforce to the witness that they are in the truth, since God has progressively cleansed his organization. Next slide. Amazingly, Jehovah's Witnesses are expected at an instant to give up current truth for new truth. They must give full allegiance to a truth today and be prepared to reject the same truth tomorrow if the Watchtower changes its teachings. So truth is always tentative in just what the society says it is. Uh, William Sentner made the mention that when he worked there, he was once told, uh, when it gets off the sixth floor, it is truth. Nathan Knorr, the president at that time, told him, and that was where their printing presses were, when it comes off the sixth floor, it's a truth. Very tentative. Next slide. New light versus being Berean Christians. The foregoing places Jehovah's Witnesses in a paradoxical dilemma in regards to Bible interpretation. For on the one hand, they are to accept without question the interpretation of the Bible provided for them by the faithful and discreet slave. Yet on the other hand, they are, at least in theory, to be Berean Christians who only accept Bible teachings which they have checked out for themselves. Next slide. Acts 17.11, now the Bereans were of more noble character than the Thessalonians, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. That is what it means to be a Berean Christian. But are the Jehovah's Witnesses Bereans? Let's go to the next slide. So here, the Watchtower of August 1st, 2001, the Bible encourages us to check our beliefs against what it teaches. Millions of readers of this magazine, The Watchtower, can testify that doing so has added purpose and stability to their lives. So be like the noble-minded Bereans. Jehovah's Witnesses will be happy to help you do this. Of course, it is your decision as to what you want to believe. However, it is the course of wisdom to make sure that your beliefs are shaped 
not by human wisdom and desires, but rather by God's revealed word. But is that actually how they actually operate? Next uh, slide. The Watchtower pays lip service to being Berean Christians. That is, they claim to accept what they are taught only after they have personally checked out the teachings against the scriptures. The reality is that they are taught to accept without question whatever the Watchtower teaches. When the society changes in interpretation, millions of Jehovah's Witnesses dutifully and instantly adopt the change. That is not being a Berean Christian, but a brainwashed cultist. Next slide. Qualified to be minister says, if we have love for Jehovah and for the organization of his people, we shall not be suspicious, but shall, as the Bible says, believe all things, all the things that the Watchtower brings out. That's not being a Berean. Watchtower 1, 15, 1983, avoid independent thinking, questioning the counsel that is provided by God's visible organization, not Brian. Next, okay, uh, yeah, to think, to think for yourself, uh, such thinking is an evidence of pride. If we get to thinking that we know better than the organization, we should ask ourselves, where did we learn Bible truth in the first place? Really, can we get along without the direction of God's organization? No, we cannot. But if I can't get along without their guidance, then how can I be a brain and check what they're teaching me? Next one, Watchtower 215, 1981. Jehovah is not pleased if we receive that food as though it might contain something harmful. We should have confidence in this channel God is using. Next slide. The choice. So the Jehovah's Witnesses have two sources of truth, the Bible and the Watchtower, which are sometimes compared to heavenly parents with the organization as mother. Unfortunately for Jehovah's Witnesses, the higher authority is the Watchtower. That is, is the Bible itself enough for someone to find salvation and live the Christian life, as 2 Timothy 3:16 and 17 says, or do we need the Watchtower or anyone else to guide us and Please God, as the society claims. Next uh, slide. So the Watchtower usurps the Bible. A person that, uh, the first one is a quote from 915, 1910, where Russell claimed that just having the studies and scriptures after two years, you'd be in the light, but if you, didn't, if you just had the Bible without the Watchtower, you'd be in darkness. And then again, the quote, unless we are in touch with this channel of communication that God is using, we will not progress along the road to life no matter how much Bible reading we do. So which one's more important? You can have the Bible, but that isn't going to get you anywhere. You have to have the Watchtower organization, according to the Watchtower. Next slide. From time to time, and I'm just going to uh, summarize this slide, it talks about those who Jehovah's Witnesses were having uh, Bible studies like David Reed was, and uh, they were studying the Bible. Uh, and But the strange thing is when they were just studying the Bible without the Watchtower material, even though they were Jehovah's Witnesses, they were reverting back to the same thing that Christendom taught 100 years ago, in other words, what the Bible actually teaches. Uh, next slide. The faithful and, uh, slave is the channel through which Jesus is feeding his true followers in this time of the end. It is vital that we recognize the faithful slave, our spiritual health, and our relationship with God depends on this channel. So again, the Watchtower is more important than the Bible. Next slide. So the choice is uh, between the Bible or the Watchtower. Um, move on to the next slide, please. So some of the implications. New light raises serious questions for Jehovah's Witnesses. If there is to be more new light, as indeed there must be, since they teach we are getting closer to Armageddon, this means that some of... What is in current Watchtower materials will later be rejected as old light and even as false teaching. So how do you know which parts of the Watchtower to believe and not to believe? Next slide. Further, is it ethical for Jehovah's Witnesses to disseminate Watchtower materials which they know that will contain things which will later be rejected as false teaching? What does it say about an organization when they are suspicious of their own material that is not recent. If you try to bring some older quotation from a watchtower to a Jehovah's Witness, they get very suspicious. As James Walker has argued, are, are we to have less confidence in the Bible because it is old material? Next slide. Jehovah's Witnesses are reluctant to consider the possibility that there will be important changes in the future. 
Yet the past shows that many things that were once held with great conviction have indeed been dropped, as we've shown examples. Next slide. If our theology and doctrine are biblically based, they should not continue to change, since the Bible itself doesn't change. Being a Berean involves making sure that our teachings conform to the Bible, not to the supposed continued revelations from God delivered through the agency of a group of men in New York City. Christians maintain that scripture is preeminent over all the works of men, including denominational traditions, creeds, and councils. I'm just about done, so I appreciate your patience. Uh, as this presentation has shown, it is difficult to maintain that the watchtower is being led by Jehovah through the supposed new light, when so often the watchtower reverts back to old light. How could God be the author of such confusion? Next slide. They will refer sometimes to John 16, 12. I have much more to say, but more than you can now bear. Uh, next slide. Notice that Jesus directed these words to the apostles and that Jesus fulfilled these words by later guiding the apostles and producing the inspired New Testament through the agency of the Holy Spirit. It is not as though Jesus taught the disciples things that he knew were wrong with the intention of correcting their understanding with new light at a later time when they were ready to receive it. Next slide. Jehovah's Witnesses point to questions that the apostles had on various things like uh, asking Jesus when he was going to set up his kingdom. And they suggest that this shows that it is acceptable for the Watchtower leadership to also make mistakes from time to time. Next slide. However, if the new light is from God, it should never change or be mistaken. Jesus never taught something and then later changed it and then changed it again. Nor from the founding of the church at Pentecost did apostolic teaching ever change, going back and forth, as though blown about by every wind of doctrine, every, Ephesians 4.14. Next slide. Further appealing to alleged errors in the thinking of the apostles does not support the Watchtower's case for new light. This is the case because the Watchtower claims new light is from God, who should know everything and would not need to keep correcting himself. Once Jehovah has provided new light, the matter should be settled, since, again, he knows everything. The fact that there are continual changes proves definitively that it is not Jehovah that is providing the new light. Next slide. With this belief in new light, the reality is that there is virtually no teaching that the Watchtower could not reject or add, no matter how long it has been held, since it is not bound really by the Bible, but only to the whims of the ever-changing governing body. Next slide. Since the Watchtower claims to be a prophet, yet denies that it is inspired, we must conclude that the Watchtower is an uninspired prophet. Since this prophet has a history of false prophecies, it must be a false prophet and should not be listened to. Closing with Deuteronomy 18.22, If what a prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord does not take place or come true, that is a message the Lord has not spoken. That prophet has spoken presumptuously. Do not be afraid of him. Deuteronomy 18.22. And that concludes my presentation. I appreciate your patience. Does anybody have any questions or comments? Yes. Thank you. Appreciate that. I know we need to probably get to lunch, but does anyone else need to make uh, want to make one more comment or question? All right. I'll turn it over to Charles.